Neanderthal man is a fraud that is even older than Darwin's theory of evolution. So desperate are evolutionists to find their imaginary missing link that they've imagined Neanderthal as an ape man. Creationists have been saying since the beginning that it was just a modern man. Over the years, evolutionists have finally come around and realized that Neanderthal man is just a modern, elderly human being suffering from rickets and arthritis. How many times do evolutionists need to see their transitionals disproven before they finally see the light? I just had to investigate. The first specimen of Neanderthal man was discovered in the Angus Caves of Belgium in 1829, 30 years before Darwin published Origin of Species. It was essentially a skull cap and a few other small parts. It was immediately identified as a modern human. In 1848, a female skull was found in Gibraltar, but its significance was overlooked and it remained in a cupboard forgotten. In 1857, miners in the Neander Valley discovered a skull cap, two femora, three right arm bones, two left arm bones, an ilium, and fragments of a scapula and ribs. They were given to Johann Karl Fulrat, who recognized their significant details. When comparing them to previous finds, he and Hermann Schaffhausen dubbed them Neanderthal Man in a joint paper. Since then, over 400 specimens of Neanderthal have been discovered, including one which was found in 1908 by Amide and Jean Boisani and Louis Bardon while they were excavating in the La Chapelle La Sang. This specimen was plagued by arthritis and was unable to walk up Right. Another specimen, Shanidar 1, was found among eight others in the mid-1950s by Ralph Solecki during an excavation in Kurdistan, Iraq. This find showed not only severe injuries and disease, but also signs of healing and regrowth, indicating altruism in Neanderthals. Both Shanidar 1 and the La Chapelle aux Sens finds are often cited by creationists to argue that Neanderthals were just a couple of elderly, diseased modern humans, as if they are the only specimens ever discovered. In fact, only one such specimen out of the 400 is known to have been arthritic. As of the publishing of this episode, no Neanderthal specimen shows any signs of rickets, a bone disease which renders the victim's bones rubbery. Although the bones of Neanderthal tend to be much denser than modern humans, and their hyoid bone facilitating speech does not seem to be descended low enough for modern human speech, the defining features are mostly in the skull. Much like Erectus in the last episode, the eye sockets are much higher and larger than modern humans. The forehead is also almost non-existent. The skull case is longer from back to front, yet is as large as and sometimes even larger than a modern human being. To date, no symptom of old age is known to cause these kinds of features. The idea becomes even more irrelevant when a significant number of the 400 known specimens are, in fact, children. Owing to these differences, William King was on the fence about whether to give Neanderthal their own genus, but dubbed them Homo Neanderthalensis in 1864. With subsequent finds, there are now a minority of scientists pushing for the idea that Neanderthals should actually be considered a subspecies of Homo sapiens. Initially, this argument was solely based on more morphological evidence. Since 1997, comparisons of Neanderthal and modern human mitochondrial DNA have been repeatedly performed. Based on the current mutation rate in mitochondrial DNA, these tests conclusively show that the most recent common female ancestor between both groups must have lived over 800,000 years ago. This would indicate a high likelihood that they are two separate species, as we know they did interact less than 50,000 years ago. In 2010, however, over 55 scientists published the results of their comparisons of the nuclear DNA between Neanderthals and several modern human cultures. They found that the genomes of non-African cultures contain between 1 and 4% Neanderthal DNA, indicating recent breeding between the two cultures. These findings would seem to be contradictory, but to genetic scientists, it is a snapshot of speciation occurring. In eukaryotes, speciation is said to occur when two isolated cultures experience so much genetic drift that when they are reintroduced, they can no longer interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Offspring. We can see this today in ligers and tigons, which are the usually infertile offspring of lions and tigers. They are almost, but not quite, speciated. In the case of Neanderthals, while there is some of their DNA in modern non-African humans, it is apparent that the only fertile offspring between the two were the result of female humans mating with male Neanderthals, meaning that female Neanderthals were unable to contribute their mitochondrial DNA to the surviving generations. If they ever had any children with male human beings, their offspring were in 
infertile. Like lions and tigers, Neanderthals were almost, but not completely speciated from humans. I go into mitochondrial DNA in much more detail in episode 14, Mitochondrial Eve. On the subject of mitochondrial Eve, these findings also complicate the creationist argument. If mitochondrial Eve was the biblical Eve, she did not contribute DNA to Neanderthals. This would definitely make them a separate species. If Neanderthals were a species of humans descended from biblical Eve, then the date of mitochondrial Eve would have to be pushed back by at least four times. At its current rate of mutation, evolutionary theory would place her at 800,000 years ago. In the case of biblical Eve, the speed of mutation without including Neanderthals would have been at least 30 to 45 times faster than its present rate. Including Neanderthals as her offspring, she would have to be at least 24,000 years old. If the creationist contention, then, is that Neanderthals are human and only descended from Biblical Eve 6,000 years ago, then the rate of mutation in mitochondrial DNA would actually have to be at least 180 to 200 times faster in the past than at its present rate. Whether or not Neanderthals were human beings or a different species ultimately has no bearing on the validity of evolution. It really is simply a matter of taxonomy. For creationists, however, either conclusion destroys any consistency in their genetic arguments. They either have to readjust the age of the Earth, being completely unscientific in determining the rate of mutation, or concede that another species of human walked the Earth. In any case, the creationist model cannot sufficiently account for the evidence. Another example of how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.